morning and happy Sabbath. I'm Jenny and this is Nancy, my sister. We're on the Brisbane River enjoying some of God's creation. As you can see, these birds are totally enjoying the Sabbath, which brings to mind Jesus' words. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they? With these thoughts in mind, we would like to welcome you to worship with us on the Sabbath morning, free from the troubles of the world. Hello South Brisbane family, my name is Caroline and I'll be taking to this prayer. So our prayer family for today is the Al Obedi family, that is our senior um, elder, Kafa, and his wife, Carmen, and their two children, their son and daughter, and grandchildren, and their son and daughter-in-law. So our pastor for today is Pastor George. He's related to um, Pastor Gideon, their cousins. So he'll be taking our sermon for today. If you are able to kneel or stand or sit, can we please pray? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this day today. Thank you for the opportunity we can pray to you this Sabbath day. Father, I pray for Kafa, our senior elder, his wife, his grandchildren, Lord, his two children, and his um, son and daughter-in-law. Father, bless Kafa in his ministry, in his efforts as an elder. Give him wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Bless the marriages of his children. Bless his grandchildren. And Lord, guide them and protect them, we ask. Bless Kafa's wife and give her the strength, give her the energy that is needed um, at home, in the church, and in other areas. Thank you for Kafa and his ministry. And we also pray, Lord, for Pastor George, as he has um, recently graduated um, from Avondale College, as your minister. Father, bless the message that he's going to give today. Let it not be his words, but your words. Send the Holy Spirit to speak to him and through him and to us. We know that you say that where two or three are gathered in your name, you will be with us. So we thank you and proclaim this promise. Father, we pray at this time for our church members who are going through challenging times, difficult times due to COVID-19. Lord, we thank you that none of us have been, in terms of any health issues, have passed away from COVID-19 at church. But Lord, we do feel very sad for those in Australia and around the world that have lost loved ones. We just pray for our church members. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, be with them and comfort them at this time. Father, we also pray for our state, as we all know that we've had two cases, plus another one, of our new COVID-19 cases from the recent incident that has occurred. Lord, we just pray that you help the health professionals and the people affected to recover and that we'll be able to manage this new case of COVID-19. We pray for our church members that are struggling due to COVID-19, emotionally, financially, mentally, physically, environmentally, Lord, across all areas. Be with each and every one of us. Father, we thank you for your promise, for your word. We thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for our church and our church family world, worldwide and in Australia. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. 
some time today, this afternoon, with mum and dad, learning a little bit more about Jesus. Today I want to share a story of um, a girl in my neighbourhood. Um, she's seven years old, and a couple months ago, she decided to do something very courageous. Um, this street, uh, they usually meet together once a month or once a fortnight to just catch up. They have a, a sleep party every now and then. But then, um, I don't know, but now mid-March, we we're all asked to stay home. You know, school closed. Uh, people started working from home. Did mom work from home? Did dad work from home? Were you, did you have to study at home? Well, this is what this girl, Mary, had to do. Um, and she thought, well, I miss my friends. I miss checking in on people. So she asked her parents, she said, oh, can we have our party on the weekend? And mom and dad said, no, remember, we can't. She said, oh, why not? So we have, we cannot see each other. We have to stay in our houses and until this thing is over, the only time we can go out is maybe, you know, we're going to get some groceries. If we need to get medical attention, but we have to stay home. So she thought, hmm, is there a way we can meet? How do we know if everybody's okay? So she took it upon herself to do this project. She decided, well, I am going to find a way that we can all we can check in on each other. 
So she looked at it, she looked into her um, bag, she got some paper, a pencil, a few stickers, decorated the papers, she made them into a little invitation. And on her on her invitation she wrote, Dear neighbor, you are invited to a street to a street party COVID style. Sunday, put a date. Please come to the driveway with a chair and sit there and wave. And then she signed her, her invitation with her name, Mary, seven years old. And then she went around in her during you know the morning walk. She put an invitation in every single letterbox on her street. Come that Sunday, 3 p.m., everyone, young and old, they all came out. And they did was wave. And that wave said, hello, yes, I am okay. It's good to see you. I am okay. The whole street waved and they all went back home. This story, um, I don't know, every time I think about it, every time I think about how this girl, how old Mary is, and the fact that she was very courageous, she thought of all this, to make sure that everyone was okay. It gives me hope. You know, in the Bible, um, there's a few people who showed courage. My favorite one is a lady called Esther. Um, she has a whole book for herself in the Bible. And maybe you can ask mom and dad to read the book with you. Uh, maybe this afternoon or sometime this week. But it doesn't, um, doesn't matter how old you are, you can be Courageous, you can be. You can do something. This time, I, um, the last few months haven't been easy, and I know as a young child, you might be thinking, "Oh, what can I do?" You know, Jesus loves us, and He does not leave us. He hasn't left us. Everything we go through, we go through it with Him. So if it's praying for someone, if it is saying hello, if it is just checking in with your friend at school to see if they are okay, you're doing great. And I can't wait to see you again. Have a good day and happy Sabbath.
Our speaker of today is CEO C. Rimoni, our first cousin to our own Pastor Gideon, and an Avondale graduate. Good morning and happy Sabbath. And um, I would like to thank God for the privilege to come and share his word with you this morning. And I would also like to thank uh, Pastor Gideon for the invitation to come again and uh, share with you as well. Before we get into our sermon this morning, I'd like uh, us to bow our heads for prayer and ask for the leading of the Holy Spirit in our study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, thank you for your blessing, and thank you for your guidance throughout this week. You thank you for bringing us together as a family, though it is under different circumstances than normally would, but we are grateful, Lord, that we can be together and worship you this morning. Lord, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us in our study. And... Uh, Hide me behind the cross, that your message may be clearer for your people this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our sermon this morning I've titled, How to Live in a Lockdown. How to Live in a Lockdown. Lockdown, isolation, social distancing, essential services seems to be the buzzwords of flight. They are words we never used to hear about until this crisis we are facing as a nation and the world. They are very powerful words too. The Premier can give the order tomorrow and uh, nothing will move between the states or even within our, our own state. Disobey the orders and you will cop a fine or maybe a jail uh, time like the latest this scare with the women that came over the border and causing an outbreak in Logan. My sister works at the Logan Hospital and uh, she said uh, on uh, Wednesday there was just a um, mad rush to the hospital. Car parks were full as people were trying to get tested for this uh, coronavirus because these ladies decided to Go and spread the love by visiting the shopping centers on the south side. Lockdown or isolation is not anything new. Satan was kind of in a smackdown, beatdown, lockdown when he was kicked out of heaven. As we'll read from Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9. Revelation 12, verses 7 to 9. I cheated a little bit by pre-marking where I'll read from in my Bible. But if you can pause and look for the text yourself when you have time. Revelation 12, verse 7 reads, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He still had access to heaven. The story of Job says that uh, he claimed to represent earth when God called a meeting with his sons. His lockdown on earth was made permanent when Jesus died on that cross. Revelation 12 verses 10 to 12 reads, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants 
of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they found out that he was serious about his lockdown orders when they failed to obey his social distancing command. They were locked out of the Garden of Eden. It must have been a torture for them to walk past that gate every day and realize what it looks like or the contrast between the before and the after of what the situation was. Isaiah described this separation in Isaiah 59 verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And that affected everyone that was the offspring of Adam. Aren't you glad you're an offspring of Adam? Maybe not. We are all in the same boat. It caused separation between Adam and Eve and nature, and a separation amongst themselves too, between the two of them. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake, and the snake had no leg to stand on. There you go. Social distancing is nothing new. It started with Satan in heaven, and then Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The separation was not going to be forever. God promised that uh, in Genesis 3.15, someone special will come and breach the gap between us and him. That's why when Eve gave birth to her firstborn, she named him Cain. It means in Hebrew, I have gotten a man, the Lord. Unfortunately, he was the first murderer. It, a taker of life instead of a preserver of life. That promise was not to be fulfilled until thousands of years later. We recently studied the book of Daniel as a Sabbath quarterly. It gave us a panoramic view of how the promised one, how the promised one came in the fullness of time according to God's plans. He gave Daniel the 2,300 year blueprint of the future. But that's the big stuff. Daniel and Revelation is about the universal vindication of God's character and how he deals with the great controversy virus. The incarnation of the Son of God was the vaccine antidote that we needed. It was critical in breaching the gap between man and his holy God. I want us to look at how Jesus came to show us what to do when it comes to handling lockdowns, living in isolation, and social distancing. I want us to have a look at a couple of stories in the New Testament. And uh, this story happens to have three versions in the Gospels. I'll be reading from the book of um, Luke, or Luke's version of this story about the invalid woman. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8, verses 40 onwards. Luke chapter 8, verses 40 onwards. And it reads, And it came to pass that when Jesus was re returned, the people gladly received him. For they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet, and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about twelve years of age, about twelve years of age, and she lay a dying, but as he went, the people thronged him. And, the wo and a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, 
Who touched me? When all denied Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And the woman saw that she was not hid. She came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Twelve long years. It's a long time to be sick. Remember that when we have an issue of blood or back in those days, you are to stay away from, from um, the community of others. For example, in, Le in Leviticus 15 verses 19 and 25, it says, And if a woman have an issue, and her issue is her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days, and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. Verse 25, And if a woman hath an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, for if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation, she shall be unclean. So she was in lockdown for 12 years. She couldn't go to church. She couldn't hang out with her friends and family. She sought help from the doctors, but to no avail. Given the time she was living, there was no Medicare or a safety net like um, the disability pension from Centrelink. She had to spend all her living. There is a possibility that she was living in the streets after all her money was gone. Maybe they were dodgy doctors. Mark 5.26 says from the contemporary English version, She had gone to many doctors, and they had not done anything except cause her a lot of pain. She had paid them all the money she had, but instead of getting better, she only got worse. They were happy to take her money, even though they could not fix her condition. Their prescription probably made it worse. Sometimes finding a good doctor is like finding a good mechanic, if you know what I mean. Maybe she was tired of Zoom and was dying to get back to church here in South Brisbane, but the dress code was too much for her. Maybe she couldn't afford a dress, let alone a tie and a suit after spending all her money on a doctor's consultancy fees. Or she was required to behave a certain way, say the proper things, before she was allowed to join the circle of the saints. I know this doesn't apply to South Brisbane Church family, but they are the usual Seventh-day Adventist checklist. Talk like us, they have to dress like us, look like us, they have to compliment our haystacks, and get their act together before they are baptized. They have to have 100 point identification papers before they are granted their uh, membership card. And when they finally get their membership card, they are allocated to a certain clique within the church, if they are lucky. Most of the time they are left to fetch on for themselves. It's like asking someone to get cleaned up before they have a shower. Isn't that the whole point of having a shower is to get cleaned up? But she heard of Jesus, the name of the miracle healer who's been healing her friends in the streets. She was determined to get close to him. If only I could touch him or touch his garment, she says to herself, that's all I want from this man. Jesus was surrounded by busy bodies. That's all... His fan base, who wanted selfies with him, 
so that they can share on Instagram or Facebook. They, in fact, were preventing Jesus from helping those who needed him the most. They came, they became a barrier to the, for this lady. Do you feel that the church life is like that sometimes? Just when you need Christ the most, people, situations, circumstances get in the way. I can imagine that, that that's how that lady felt. There was at one time I could not fit in my so-called church clothes. And I made up excuses not to go to church because people judge you you know, for not wearing church clothes. It wasn't until I was able to afford a new wardrobe that falls under the category of church clothes that I was able to go back to church. She persevered and managed to touch his garment. Now, from a casual reading of the story, it was touch, uh, touch and Jesus felt it. And that, but you have to read all three gospel versions of the story to get a deeper understanding of what happened and how this woman touched Jesus and why his disciples thought that Jesus lost his marbles when he asked, who touched me? If you bent over, like for example I'm doing now, and touched my toes, regardless of whether you are in the crowd or not, you will draw attention to yourself. From Mark and Luke's accounts, that's the last thing she wanted. She doesn't want to make a big fuss about it. She just wants to touch his garment and go by her own business. So why would she touch the hem of Jesus' garment? Let me posit to you this idea. She was already on the ground. Perhaps those medications she took from those bush doctors crippled her. The only way for her to um, get around was to prop up herself with her hands or arms. Hence the disciples not knowing who touched Jesus. It's like when you knock on a door and you expect an adult to open the door at eye level and then you realize that there was a child and then you look down and see a child that opened the door. They dismissed her as maybe just another invalid woman on the streets, another homeless beggar looking for food. That's probably why they didn't notice her reaching out for the hem of his garment. Or maybe they did, but they tried to avoid her photobombing their selfies. However, God stopped long enough to acknowledge her faith and perseverance despite the social distancing and living in isolation for 12 long years. Jesus said, but in the Matthew 9.22 says, But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole that hour. Another lesson that I picked up from this story is that just hanging around Jesus doesn't get you healed. Let me, I'll let you think about that for a minute. Your know, membership in the church doesn't guarantee you receive healing. Look at these disciples hanging around Jesus all day, but missed this miracle happening. It bypassed them completely. So be careful of our motives for hanging around Jesus. Remember Matthew 7, those who cried out, Lord, Lord, it's not a good story. Another story I would like us to look at is also found in the Gospel, but only in John chapter 4. The story of another woman, the Samaritan woman. If you have time to read it, it's found in John chapter 4, verses 1 to 45. I'll just read the introduction and the starting bit, and then we'll summarize and go through the lessons I want us to highlight from this story. I'll read from Luke, uh, sorry, John chapter 4. And it starts, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, this is about discipleship, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. 
If you look at the map of um, Israel at the time, to get to Galilee, you had to go through Samaria. It, and Samaria is a very large area. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Sychar is almost in the middle of Samaria, so you can't really avoid Samaria if you go to Sychar. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which is like the midday, twelve o'clock in the afternoon. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for this or his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. And then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask me, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Here we have another woman, another story of a woman interacting with Jesus. The Jews made it a rule that they should be social distancing from the Samaritans. They must avoid traveling through Samaria if they could, and they must not accept food or a cup of water from the Samaritans. Hence, the surprise reaction from the Samaritan woman when Jesus asked for water. Culturally, culturally, she should have offered him water. But the social distancing was so bad between the Jews and the Samaritans, she couldn't be bothered offering him any. It was in the middle of the day. She was practicing social distancing herself from her community because there was also a rheumatory virus that was rampant about her past relationships as well as her current one. The last thing she expected was a nosy Jewish man talking to her. But when God makes an appointment to meet with you, it will happen regardless. She tried to avoid the conversation as much as possible. Lots of deflection as this nosy guy was getting into her business. He doesn't want us to keep on going he wants accountability because he loves us. He doesn't want us to keep going down the path where separation from him will be final. According to the desire of ages, the longer the conversation went, the more she realized her vulnerability and her, and her need of a savior. She finally dropped her pot of water and went to her village to tell him of the good news of the gospel of the Messiah she has met. The disciples walked in on the conversation and wondered why Jesus were not pra was not practicing social distancing rules. They urged him to eat, but he ignored them. And as they were about to witness, because they were about to witness how discipleship is done. Sure enough, her whole village came to see Jesus. They even begged him to stay with them. And he stayed for two days. The desire of ages says that the disciples had to put up with Jesus breaking the social distancing rules. I bet you they couldn't get out of there fast enough when they left Samaria. Here's a quote from the pen of inspiration. The, wor the worker in foreign fields will come in contact with all classes of people and all varieties of minds. And he will find that different methods of labor are required to meet the needs of the people. The methods and means by which we reach certain ends are not always the same. The missionary must use reason and judgment. Experience will 
indicate the wisest course to follow under existing circumstances. It is often the case that the customs and climate of a country make a condition of things that would not be tolerated in another country. The changes for the better must be made, but it is best not to be too abrupt. Here's another one as well. That's from uh, Gospel Workers, page 468. Here's another one from uh, the Story of Redemption, page 287, 288. Peter spoke with Cornelius and those assembled in the, his house concerning the custom of the Jews, that it was considered unlawful for them to mingle socially with Gentiles and involved, ceremon uh, and involved ceremonial defilement. It was not prohibited by the law of God, but the, the tradition of men had made it a binding custom. I have a confession to make. Confession is good for the soul. Would you say amen? Um, often you hear literature evangelists say that their work will carry on until Jesus' second coming, whilst all the other ministry fade away or stopped. Well, the coronavirus disproved that theory. You can't just rock up and knock on people's house anymore. I'm not having a dig at the LEs. I love the LEs and the work they do. I'm just making a point to prove my next one. That is, I went to church during lockdown. I enjoyed it so much that I went there twice a week. It's an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. No, not the uh, Reformers or the Independent Ministry. As a matter of fact, it is the most uh, neglected offshoot of our church since we became inward focused with uh, women's ministry, men's ministry, singles ministry, etc., etc., we've cast it aside for something for others to do. Like the phrase, we pay, you pray. We are happy to toss money at it, um, but let it be someone else's problem. Even giving money as a church has declined. We've come up with excuses not to collect the offering for this offshoot of ours. This offshoot of our church that I attended happens to be called Adra Logan. Growing up in the church, it used to be called Dorcas. The only Seventh-day Adventists there are the manager, Hank, the training coordinator, Sam, and uh, the Adra chaplain, Pastor Andre. The other 99% are non Seventh day Adventist volunteers. Sam came to me at the beginning of the year at church and asked if I could help out because their Monday driver pulled out. After my first Monday at uh, this church, I thought I should help out some more. So I would volunteer on Monday as a favor to Sam. And I would volunteer on Tuesdays because of the people that are there. As I got to know their names and their stories, I came to realize that they are just as precious to God as those whom I go to church with at Eden's Landing Church. They may not be comfortable in the church because of the uh, social requirements we often put up as a barrier. But for them, Adra is their church, their family, where they have Christian friends who do not judge them. They can come as they are and feel safe to learn about God. Can you imagine send, uh, God sending all these peoples into our churches? Are you ready for the influx? He will probably be uncomfortable with in their presence. But you know what's worse? Them being uncomfortable in your presence. And who's supposed to be the Christian here? I had a conversation with Sam and Hank the other day. We agreed that every church should have an Adra center. So it should be an Adra center. It's a good excuse to remain open when there's another lockdown. 
even on Sabbath. The homeless and the needy don't take a day off just because we have a lockdown for our own safety. Even in those moments of crisis, we as a church should step up to the plate. Instead of hibernating for six weeks or months, doing ministry by remote control, or should I say, Zoom. No one is allowed into those meetings except members of the church with passwords, right? So how are we going to fulfill the Great Commission by Zoom? What do you think, South Brisbane family? For your information, our Eden's Landing was supposed to open, uh, our Eden's Landing Church was supposed to open the Sabbath with a limit of 50 people. And you uh, bring your own lunch after for fellowship afterwards, maintaining the social distancing. Due to people breaking the social distancing rules uh, this week, it's cancelled. If they had an ed- address centre there, you could still do your Christian duty and serve the community regardless because it is an essential service to do so. I guess getting together for worship and hearing the word is not as essential as doing the word. Here's uh, my final quote for today. It's found in the uh, Councils to Teachers, uh, Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 323. The followers of Christ are to separate from the world in principles and interests, but they are not to isolate themselves from the world. The Savior mingled constantly with men, not to encourage them in anything that was not in accordance with God's will, but to uplift and ennoble them. I sanctify myself, he declared, that they also might be sanctified. So the Christian is to abide among men, that the savour of divine love may be as a salt to preserve the world from corruption. Jesus was showing us that we cannot do ministry in isolation or by social distancing. We have to get down to where the people are. He broke every social distancing rule in order to reach out to these two women. My final story tonight is a story about a lady named Sue. She was um, a volunteer at ADRA. We, a couple of weeks ago, we had a memorial service for her since she passed away. Andre, Pastor Andre told the story of how when they do devotionals at uh, ADRA, they call it Toolbox, um, she kicked up a fuss and didn't want to participate, let alone go in there when they have devotional. But eventually she changed her mind and started attending the devotionals in the morning, the Toolbox, we call it the Toolbox. One day a new presenter did the, the, the Toolbox and um, after she finished, she sat down without doing a closing prayer because they always end with a closing prayer. This lady, Sue, piped up and said, oh, you forgot the prayer. For someone that actually didn't want anything to do with the toolbox or devotionals, she reminded them of the prayer, the closing prayer. While she was battling uh, cancer and having treatment at the hospital, Hank and Pastor Andre visited uh, this lady, Sue, and um, she told Pastor Andre that there's a chapel within the hospital. And every time she walked past that chapel, she thought of Andre and prayer. To Sue, before she passed away, the face of Jesus was Pastor Andre. How she came to understand Jesus was, was how Pastor Andre treated her at the address center in Logan. My, friend, that, my friends and family here at um, Brisbane, South Brisbane Church, that's how we do ministry. Get alongside people. And I would like to put in a plug for Adra Logan. If you have free time, come and help out. Mingle with these folks. Let them see your Christianity shine amongst them like a salt to savor those in need to hear about Christ.
And on that note, I would like to close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of these women. One had an issue of blood of no fault of her own, but she was willing to break the social distancing rules just to reach out to her Savior. The other one tried to avoid others because of her past and the things that she did herself but it didn't stop you from reaching out to her even with the social distancing Lord we have people in our community who are, who are holding up their cup for, for water that you promised them and the healing that comes only from you we pray Lord that we be not barriers for them, in order for them to um, reach out to you. God forbid that we do that. And God forbid that we prevent them from being part of your kingdom when you return. We ask, Father, that you bless our family here in South Brisbane as we continue to witness within this community. And may you be glorified with souls that are well-deserving of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.